Hi, I'm Dr. Nitin Chobel. I'm a practicing ultrasonologist from India, Mumbai. I'm involved in both private practice as well as institutional practice. And I'm going to talk today on ultrasound in parasitic infestations. Uh, ultrasound in parasitic infestations. Uh, some years back, we never thought that we would be seeing parasites on ultrasound, but things are quite different today. Our interest in this field began several years back when we had this young patient who was referred to us for suspected varicoceles. But instead of dilated veins, what we saw is multiple hypoechoic channels and within that, we saw these linear structures which were continuously dancing. We now know that these are dilated lymphatics in the inguinal region and these linear structures are nothing but filarial worms. And this is now known as the filarial dance. And since it's a dance, it's quite apt to give it some music and also some disco lights to make it more interesting of course. Around that time we had this another young child who came with acute pain in the right hypochondrium. The child was not able to stand or even lie down on the table and the reason for all this was this roundworm sitting in his common bile duct and in front of our eyes this roundworm decided to walk into the duodenum and the child had miraculously became all right without any pain and walked out from the clinic. Those days we did not have good recording facilities and we could not record this movement of the roundworm into the duodenum. So this was our first exposure to parasites and after that we have been seeing parasites all over the body. In fact biliary system is one of the commonest areas where we see parasites typically ascariasis. Ascariasis can be seen either in the gallbladder or in the biliary system, the common bile duct or sometimes even in the intrahepatic radicals. The worms could be dead as in this case in the gallbladder or they could be alive as we see in the common bile duct. Most of the times they are asymptomatic and they pass out through the common bile duct into the duodenum without any cause but sometimes they can give obstruction. And as you can see here, it's quite difficult to remove these roundworms from the common bile duct through the spinter. As you can see, the surgeon is trying to remove the roundworm, but they are trying to slip out of his forceps. So this can be a very difficult task indeed if they cause obstruction. In this child, the roundworms decided to go into the intrahepatic radicals. As you can see, we have intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation as well as ascariasis within these radicals. This child presented with symptoms of cholangitis and jaundice. In fact, parasites, as we know, can be divided into two groups, the protozoa and the helminths. And as we go on through the lecture, we will see a lot of examples in both these groups. Different parasites have affinity for different areas of the body and this also will highlight in the talk. Ascariasis is technically known as Ascarias lumbricoides and it's the largest nematode in the body. Typically, for example, because of a high resolution machine, we can see details of the roundworm. This is a child and we can see the small intestine we can see the mucosal folds of the intestine. Within the lumen of the intestine, we have our friend, the roundworm sitting. In the center of the roundworm, we have the intestine of the roundworm. And if you look very carefully, within the intestine of the roundworm, we have some foot particles moving to and fro. So probably by looking at these foot particles, we could guess what this child had for his lunch or dinner. This just goes to say that the resolution of the present day machines is so good that we are able to see details of the parasites. Ascariasis lumbricoides 
has a life cycle completed in one host which is the man and the mode of infection is ingestion of eggs containing second stage infective larvae in food drink and raw vegetables most of the times these are asymptomatic but they can cause nasty complications for example very often in children they can cause intestinal obstruction here what we see is what is known as a bolus of roundworms that is a group of roundworms which are stuck into the intestine causing obstruction this can be seen on ultrasound as well as on a plain x-ray where we have a group of roundworms with intestinal obstruction the other complication which can be seen in the intestine is intersusception a roundworm can be a source of intersusception as we saw in this child we have intersusception and at surgery the cause of this intersusception was a roundworm they can go to some odd places for example this roundworm has gone into the appendix and has caused acute appendicitis but this was the most adventurous of them this child had a ventricular peritoneal shunt for hydrocephalus and he presented with severe headache when we looked at his abdomen what had happened was one of the roundworms has had perforated his intestine and gone through the peritoneal cavity walked into the ventricular peritoneal shunt so much so that he had to be removed by a surgical technique so as i said this was probably one of the most adventurous roundworm we had seen the other parasite which is typically seen in the biliary system is liver fluke which is also known as fasciola hepatica this is a child who came to us again with symptoms of cholangitis we can see intrahepatic biliary dilatation we can see gall bladder wall thickening and we can see a dilated common bile duct with ecogenic areas within it if you magnify the common bile duct we can see linear areas because of the parasite which is the liver fluke and that's the endoscopic picture of the parasites and we can see multiple liver flukes within the common bile duct and this is how the liver fluke actually looks like when you examine it under the microscope this is also known as common liver fluke or sheep liver fluke and is a parasitic flatworm which infects liver of various mammals including humans the drug of choice in the treatment of fasciolosis is triclabendazole and this child was put on this drug this is a very toxic drug and the child requires careful monitoring during the therapy but after a gap of one month we can see that the common bile duct is totally clear and there is nothing seen in the lumen the technique which we use to see the common bile duct at this time is the x matrix technology which is a wonderful tool to see the gall bladder and the common bile duct we can see other parasites in the intestines typically we can see enterobiasis which is known as spin worm this is most commonly seen in the region of the cecum and in the region of the appendix the other parasite which we commonly see in this area is the whip worm which is also known as trichuris trichura of course on ultrasound it can be very difficult to differentiate the different types of parasites but the final answer comes through the stool examination where we can see the tropozoites and cysts of the parasites within the stool of course one patient can have multiple parasites or worms at the same time and this is very often referred to as polyparasitosis and this can be seen on a colonoscopic examination different parasites require different laboratory tests sometimes we might have to do serological tests sometimes we might have to do skin reaction tests and sometimes we might have to restore to molecular techniques as well the other parasite which is very commonly seen in practice is the hydatid cyst which is also known as echinococcus granulosus the life cycle of echinococcus granulosus is completed in two hosts there's a definitive host which is the dog 
or a wolf and an intermediate host which is the sheep or the man and the mode of infection is ingestion of food and drink contaminated with Echinococcus granulosus X. On ultrasound there are three diagnostic features. One is the hydrated fluid which is secreted by the endocyst and hydrated sand which is typically seen in this slide which is falling down within the hydrated cyst and daughter cysts which are tiny cystic areas within the hydrated cyst. This is a very classical example of daughter cyst within an hydrated cyst. The hydrated cyst has three layers. The pericyst which is a rigid protective layer, an ectocyst which is an acellular laminated membrane and an endocyst which is the inner germinal layer. There are various ways of classifying hydrated disease. Two popular ways are the WHO classification where we have CE1, CE2, CE3, CE4 and CE5 and the Garbage classification where we have type 1 which is a pure fluid collection, type 2 where we have fluid collection with a split wall, type 3 where we have fluid collection with septae, type 4 where we have hydrated cyst with heterogeneous eco pattern and type 5 where we have hydrated cyst with reflecting thick walls. This is an example of type 1 cyst which is sonolucent, type 2 cyst with a membrane, type 3 cyst with multiple septae, type 4 cyst which is heterogeneous and type 5 cyst which is highly reflective. The diagnosis of hydrated comes very often after aspirating the hydrated cyst and pointing out towards the scolex in the fluid. Cassoni's test was a popular test done for hydrated disease but nowadays we also have zero diagnosis where we have we can detect antibody to hydrated this is very often known as the Capron's arc test. Sometimes we can make a diagnosis of hydrated cyst surprisingly. For example, in this patient there was a cystic lesion in the liver. After aspirating this cyst, we saw the separation of the germinal layer which led to a diagnosis of an hydrated cyst. There are various ways of treating hydrated disease and nowadays one of the popular way is scopy and through the scopy you can see some daughter cysts coming out. Now when you remove the hydrated from the liver it's very important to get the entire cyst out of the liver and wrap it up in a plastic bag so that there is no peritoneal spill into the peritoneal cavity and the entire hydrated along with the plastic bag is then removed out of the body. We can also treat this conservatively either with alcohol or hypertonic saline injections. Typically hypertonic saline is most popularly known used nowadays. There are two techniques of injection. One is what is known as a pair technique where you do a percutaneous aspiration, injection and re-aspiration or a PAI technique where you do a percutaneous aspiration and injection. Hydrated can be seen in a lot of places. Here for example we have a renal hydrated which is seen in the upper pole of the kidney and these are the classical daughter cysts in the upper pole of the kidney on ultrasound as well as on the CT scan. This is an example of a splenic hydrated. Within the spleen we can see a cyst with daughter cysts and that's the left kidney there. Sometimes we can have extensive hydrated. For example in this patient we have a hydrated cyst in the liver, we have a hydrated spleen, cyst in the spleen, we have a hydrated in the region of the adrenal as well as in the retroperitoneal area behind the bladder. Sometimes we can see extensive hydrated disease involving almost the entire abdomen from the zippy sternum to the pelvis. And in fact, sometimes we wonder whether this disease can affect everything except maybe the nails and the teeth. Lung is another area where we very often see hydrated and needless to say that a CT scan is very useful in this situation. This was an interesting case. We had an opacity in the left lung which on x-ray could have been anything 
from tuberculous granuloma to metastatic deposit, we did a CT scan and since this lesion was very close to the anterior chest wall, we decided to put in a needle under ultrasound guidance. And to our surprise, when this fluid was examined under the microscope, we saw this scoliosis of hydrated disease. So this was a surprising diagnosis. A very close differential diagnosis of hydrated in the liver is amoebic liver abscess, which is commonly seen in these areas. The liver abscess does not have a classical hydrated sand, nor does it have classical dotesis, but it is very common to see septae within amoebic liver abscesses. Amoebic liver abscess is caused by end amoeba histolytica. The life cycle is again completed in one host, the man, and the mode of infection is ingestion of cyst through water and vegetables contaminated with infective feces, flies or a direct transfer from cyst carriers. Liver abscesses caused by N. amoeba histolytica has various stages in the liver and various appearances. It can be a totally unliquefied abscess, it can be a semi-liquefied abscess, it can be a liquefied abscess with posterior acoustic enhancement or it can be an organized abscess with dense echoes and thick walls. Very often, with good treatment, this amoebic liver abscesses resolve. But sometimes, if they do not resolve or if the patient has more symptoms, we might have to aspirate them under ultrasound guidance. Sometimes, we might have to leave behind a pigtail catheter till the abscess is totally drained. A patient could have multiple liver abscesses. And in fact, this is a postpartum a picture of a liver showing multiple abscesses from Dr. Opi Kapoor's book on amoebic liver abscesses and he has done extensive work in this subject. Liver abscesses very often resolve or you have to drain them but sometimes they can present with multiple complications and one such complication is a rupture. Here for example we have a liver abscess from the which is rupturing into the subphrenic area tearing the diaphragm and extending into the pleural cavity. So the abscesses can rupture into the perihepatic space, they could rupture into the peritoneal cavity, they could rupture into the pleura or the lung or they could rupture even into the pericardium. This is another example of a ruptured liver abscess. We see a lot of perihepatic space fluid and we see fluid within the right thorax. Sometimes it might be very difficult to differentiate an unliquefied liver abscess from a solid liver tumour. This differentiation is very important. In the earlier days, we used to resort to CT or sometimes maybe an MRI to differentiate between the two. But nowadays, we use contrast to differentiate the two. Typically on contrast, we see that an abscess does not show any internal enhancement. We see peripheral enhancement with a relatively quick washout and sometimes we, we might see peripheral hyperemia. In abscesses, very often, we might see enhancement of the septae within the abscess. So, ultrasound contrast is a very good technique, especially to differentiate an unliquefied abscess from a solid tumour. Liver abscesses, of course, which are of amoebic origin, have to be differentiated from those which are of pyogenic origin. Typically, pyogenic abscesses are multiple, they are scattered, and very often, again, on contrast, they show enhancement. Sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between the two. History and sometimes aspiration are helpful to differentiate the two. Amoebiasis can also involve the intestine and typically very often we might see marked thickening of the terminal ileum, the cecum and the ascending colon. Indirect hemagglutination tests like the IHA tests are available for the diagnosis of amoebiasis. One patient could get infested with multiple parasites. Here for example we have one patient 
who has amoebic liver abscess along with roundworms in the intestine. The other parasite which is very well seen on ultrasound is filariasis or more commonly what we see is the Vucheria bancrofti. Typically these are seen in dilated lymphatics in the region of the inguinal canal and as we have seen earlier what we see is a continuous or a non-stop dance. This can also be recorded on a pulse Doppler because of the movement. In the initial days, just to make sure that we are dealing with the correct diagnosis, we used to aspirate these lymphatic channels and look at these worms under the microscope. Lymphatic filariasis is a major cause of morbidity in parts of Asia, Africa and the Western Pacific. Almost about 120 million people are affected worldwide. But almost about 75 million are asymptomatic and therefore this goes undetected. The life cycle is completed in two hosts. The definitive host is a man and the intermediate host is a mosquito and the mode of infection is a mosquito bite whereby the third stage or the infective larvae are liberated. We not only see filariasis involving the lymphatics in the inguinal region but very often we might see the filarial worms even in the epididymis. A chronic manifestation of filariasis can be in the form of lymphadenopathy, in the, it can be in the form of lymphedema, a bad disease which is known as elephantiasis, hydrocele or chyluria. Sometimes some of these patients could be referred for a color doppler of the venous system to rule out venous insufficiency or thrombosis. But all we see in these patients on ultrasound is marked thickening of the skin with poor penetration of the sound beam. We can see these dilated lymphatics not only in the region of the inguinal canal all along the scrotal wall but sometimes we might also see them in the retroperitoneal area. For example, in this patient, we see dilated lymphatics in the retroperitoneum in the right iliac fossa and within these dilated lymphatics, we have the filarial worms dancing. This is a very interesting case. This patient presented with a linear swelling close to the elbow, which was thought to be a venous malformation and hence the patient was referred for a color Doppler. But when we did our ultrasound, we realized that instead of a venous malformation, what we have is multiple linear channels and within these linear channels, we have the filarial worm dancing. And this was indeed a case of filariasis and not of venous malformation. Breast is another common site for filariasis. And this happens because of the loose adipose tissue. So very often on mammography you might see a mass but on ultrasound you realize that this is a sonolucent mass with multiple dancing filaria. And this is one situation where a patient who presented with a mass or when you see a mass on mammography you are indeed happy to see such filarial worms because you know that you are not dealing with malignancy. So sometimes in the breast we might pick up very small lesions and within these small lesions, we might see the filarial dance. So with some or sometimes in the breast, we might see multiple dilated lymphatic channels like this. And within the dilated lymphatic channels, we see the filarial worms. And again, they can produce artifacts on color Doppler simply because of the movements. This is a very unusual case of a parotid filariasis which has, given, which has been given to me by one of my friends. Very often with treatment, the intensity of the dance reduces and whenever there is a healing, what we see is a filarial granuloma which is quite an ecogenic area without any live worms within. The other parasite which could have some ultrasound features is Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium falciparum which give rise to malaria. Very often on ultrasound, we, must, we might just see hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. Malaria, as we all know, is the most important parasitic disease of man described since antiquity. And approximately about 5% of the world population is infected. This is still a major cause of death 
in the tropical countries. The life cycle is completed in two hosts, the man and the female anophilin mosquito and the mode of infection is a mosquito bite whereby the sporozoites are liberated into the bloodstream. Malaria has two types. One is a benign malaria where the patient very often gets fever, anemia and settles down. But we can have a malignant malaria where we can have lot of complications including cerebral malaria etc. This is one complication where ultrasound can be useful. If a patient of malaria has a acute pain in the abdomen, a possibility is of a splenic rupture. And here we have a patient who has a splenomegaly with a splenic rupture with perisplenic fluid collection. The other complication which is rarely seen in malaria is a splenic infarct. And whenever patients with malaria present with acute pain in the left upper abdomen, you should suspect splenic infarcts. On ultrasound, we typically see them as a wedge-shaped hypoechoic area and on color Doppler, there is no flow. Contrast, again, is very useful in making a definitive diagnosis of splenic infarcts and we can again save this patient from costly investigations. A very close differential diagnosis of malaria with a similar presentation is dengue fever. Dengue, however, is not a parasitic infestation. It is a viral infection. But it has got typical ultrasound features. Typically, what we see is marked thickening of the gallbladder wall and edema. We might see polycerositis with fluid in the pleural cavity and fluid in the peritoneal cavity. This is another typical finding of dengue. Very often, we have petical hemorrhages in the adrenal gland and this gives rise to a very bright adrenal. Dengue, as I said, is a virus, viral fever, which is transmitted from the human to human by a mosquito bite and man is a reservoir of virus. There are two deadly complications of dengue. One is a dengue hemorrhagic fever and the other is a dengue shock syndrome. This is a classical case again of a dengue where we have marked gallbladder wall edema, we have free peritoneal fluid with internal echoes and this is one of the characteristic features. We see fluid typically in the right flank extending above the psoas and this fluid typically has dense internal echoes because this is an hemorrhagic fluid. So these are very classical findings of dengue fever and we can make a diagnosis of dengue based on ultrasound. The other parasite which gives rise to huge splenomegaly is Leishmaniasis, popularly known as Kala Azar. Here, we can have a spleen which can extend right from the left hypochondrium to the right iliac fossa. And when you have a patient with a huge spleen with fever, one has to think of Leishmaniasis. The other parasites which has typical ultrasound features is Cystosomiasis and Bilaziasis. I must admit that I don't see these patients in India and all these cases have been given to me by my friend Dr. Ravi Kadasane who works in UAE and the patients which he sees are typically migrants from the Egyptian area. On ultrasound, typically what we see is marked thickening of the urinary bladder wall, sometimes calcification of the urinary bladder wall. Cystosomiasis, and I'll do that again, sorry, yeah. Bilaziasis was named after the person who first observed it. However, the name was changed because of the unique appearance of the male worm, which looks as if it is split, split longitudinally. So cystosomiasis virtually means a split body where a canal is produced in which the female position herself. So now it is typically known as cystosomiasis. We have two common types. One is the cystosomiasis mansoni and the other is hematobium. The life cycle is completed again in two hosts, the man and the snail. And the mode of infection is through the skin when man comes in contact with water containing infected snails and thus the final stage larvae. Here we have another example of cystosomiasis with involvement not only of the bladder but also involvement of the lower ureter where we see 
mark thickening of the ureta and stricture. Another common site of infestation is the mesenteric vessels and the portal venous system and this typically gives rise to periportal fibrosis and therefore very often these patients present with portal hypertension because of periportal fibrosis. The other parasite which is which has typical ultrasound features is the cysticercus of tinea. Typically these are cystic areas within the muscle and within the cystic area we have one bright echo. The life cycle is completed in two hosts. The definitive host is the man and the intermediate host is cow, buffalo or pigs and the mode of infection is eating uncooked beef or pork containing these eggs. So typically as I said within the muscles we have sonolucent areas with one bright echo and very often just to confirm the diagnosis we might also put in a needle and aspirate the fluid. So here we have cystisarcosis affecting the scapular area and here we have a cystisarcosis in the chest wall. Sometimes of course we can have extensive cystisarcosis and for this we require help of other imaging modalities like CT and MR. Dracunculosis is another parasite which can be seen on ultrasound. This is popularly known as guinea worm infection. The most common presentation is on x-rays where we very often see linear bright calcified opacities in the soft tissues. If you want to do an ultrasound again we will see a sonolucent area with a linear echo within the center. The life cycle is again completed in two hosts. The definitive host is the man and an intermediate host is the cyclops and the mode of infection is drinking water containing infective cyclops and this is how a typical guinea worm looks like when it is extracted through the body. Something which looks similar to this is actinomycosis. This is not a parasite. This is a fungal infection but it has got a similar appearance. We have hypoechoic tracts and we have linear bright echoes within this. A very bad form of fungal infection typically seen in India is what is known as maduromycosis named after the place from where we see this. This can give rise to extensive soft tissue masses and it can give rise to bony destruction as well and it can lead to amputation of the foot as well. The other parasite which has some ultrasound features typically in the fetus is Toxoplasma gonadii. Here again the life cycle is completed in two hosts. The enteric cycle we have a cat and for the exoenteric cycle we have the man. Typically in the fetus antenatally we see calcifications in the periventricular area that is a postnatal follow up or we might see calcifications within the abdomen of the fetus typically affecting the liver or the adrenal gland. But whenever we see calcific foci in a fetus, one should also consider the possibility of CMV infection which again is not a parasitic infestation but a viral infection but can present in a similar way. So to conclude, several parasitic infestations can have direct or indirect ultrasound features. Ultrasound can be useful in diagnosis, management and follow up of patients. I have to thank my friend and colleagues who have contributed to this talk.